Welcome back to another segment here at the Open Mic Broadcast Network. I am the radio guy, Dr. Mike Prince. We are fortunate to have on the line with us right now, none other than the head basketball coach for men's basketball program at Prairie View A&M University. That's none other than Coach Byron Smith. How are you doing today, my man? I'm doing well, Mike, and yourself? Well, you know what? I'm not going to complain. Um, a very interesting uh, Final Four as we have it, but I'm pleased with it. Um, you on uh, the deeper spectrum of this thing, how are you seeing this thing unfold so far? Hey, man, it's been a, been some surprises, obviously. I think the, the big dogs, the top four seeds, none of them are in it, you know, which is a, a bit of a surprise because two of the top seeds were U of H and, and Alabama. And I thought, definitely thought that they were playing – uh, the type of basketball that would warrant them being uh, one of the final four teams that's still in the tournament. So, uh, but it, you know what? The way we see things, the way we feel, doesn't always come to be and come to pass. So, um, definitely been a fun tournament to watch. Uh, definitely some underdogs uh, that have played some really good basketball, some dominant basketball by a couple of teams. Um, so, you know, that's why they call it March Madness. You never know. Your 40 minutes against their 40 minutes on that particular afternoon. Um, and uh, these four teams have played some really strong 40 minutes, and that's the reason why they're, uh, they're, they're still in it. No doubt. I love how you slid that U of H in there first over Alabama. You know? <laughs> always a cool, right? Go cool. Right? Always, always. <laughs> go cool. Well, look, when you, you know, you got people on the other end of the spectrum saying, man, this is the worst Final Four ever. None mm-hmm. of the Blue Bloods are here, this, that, and the other. And my uh, antidote to all of them is stop whining. Because no one cheated those programs. They lost fair and square. Um, right. it, it's, it's, it should bring a glimmer of hope to a program like Prairie View that, hey, these guys can do it. Why can't we? Because when you look at the final four that remain, UConn, um, uh, San Diego State, uh, uh, Florida Atlantic, and Miami. Now, by, Miami has what some would consider the bigger brand. But they're the smaller institution remaining. They only have 19, I say only, but they have 19,000 students. Everybody else is 30-plus thousand students. So this this is a whole new era of basketball, at least for this year as we know it, huh? Yeah, I agree, Mike, with, with, with what you're saying. I think the thing that we people need to pay attention to and look at it is just um, it's extreme parity. Uh, in, in college basketball. Now, uh, you know, I think you look at the four teams and I think that you'd have to agree um, that, you know, it's a lot of balance now. I mean, obviously in football, you know, you, it's normally Alabama or Georgia, uh, you know, those schools that are, you know, at the top, Clemson, you know, to, to, to a degree, um, usually, uh, you know, playing on that, on that Monday night uh, in February or January, I should say. Uh, for the championship, so you pretty much have an idea of one of three to four, one of three teams probably going to be your national champion in football. But obviously in basketball, it's 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 not so obvious, and I think that's what you know makes what's such a great tournament, a great time of year. You don't know, uh, obviously you know Kansas, you know winning it, you know last year, and you know Villanova made some nice runs, and, and obviously people always expect Kentucky to be there and have a chance to win it just because of the type of talent that they're able to attain. But I just think that it's just parody, and I think that's what makes it so exciting and intriguing. And I, I think that's what makes it one of the most watched sports events in the world today, uh, March Madness. You know, these two weeks is, is a fun time of year. But I just think you have to point to the parody, that it's a lot of balance in college basketball now. And I think you're right. You know, programs like Prairie View, uh, you know, Texas Southern, uh, you know, why not? You know, we can be the St. Peter's or the Florida Atlantic, you know, of the uh, – you know, of, of, of the NCAA tournament. So it definitely gives you hope and it motivates you to get back on the grind uh, and get back and work towards having a chance to be in this thing next year. Uh, not sure if we can be in it this late, but just to be in it, to go through it and have a chance to be, to advance. I mean, it's really exciting and, and definitely attainable. Something that we that we definitely uh, look forward to uh, putting ourselves in a position to be able to do that. Look, and I may have should have started this uh, segment off with a disclaimer because uh, I know that I've gotten in, I guess, hot water in the past on my opinions, but it is the Mike Prince show, and I can <laughs> voice how I feel about certain things, right? Uh, but uh, by no means do I want to get you in an uncomfortable position. <laughs> but, it builds character, um, Mike. It's okay. It builds uh, uh, character. 
Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, um, here is where we always talk about the culture change, right? Culture, culture, culture. In fact, it, I think the difference that culture doesn't start with a new head coach. Mm-hmm. Culture mm-hmm. doesn't start with new recruits. Mm-hmm. Culture starts with leadership, athletic mm-hmm. directors, and presidents understanding mm-hmm. the true role of athletics. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm going to mm-hmm. ask this question. Um, mm-hmm. You've had success at Prairie View, and I, and I thank you for that. And, and mm-hmm. you have built a very competitive, consistent program. You might not have won uh, seven championships, but you did win three. You did have 37 home <laughs> wins at home. You yeah, know, and you. how <laughs> uh, aggravating or frustrating is it when you are obviously in football country? You're obviously in football country, and it seems like no matter how loud you scream, how hard you bang, you still handle, and these are my words, and I'm not talking about you personally. I'm just talking about basketball in the Southwestern Athletic Conference. It is handled and treated as a second-class citizen. <laughs> I think so. I mean, I think you're right. You know, and um, I mean, obviously, you know, Texas, you know, and Louisiana, where I'm from, originated. Uh, those, those are football states, and it's football first, and it's everything else second. Um, but, you know, it's it, it's just the world in which we live. I mean, I think that we all should be able to have a seat at the table. Um, you know, obviously, your, 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 your top two sports, football and basketball. Um, but I just think it's all a choice. Uh, and I think people um, will support, you know, the things that they've come to know and the things that, have, that bring them the most joy. Um, and, and the thing that gets the most attention, uh, I think that's what people put most of their effort um, and and I and obviously I, I I like to share the table, uh, you know here you know I have a tremendous relationship with everybody here all the coaches, um, but yeah I, I, you're right I mean obviously it, it is it is a football place, um, and you know but that doesn't stop us or make us less uh, eager uh, to have a top program and I'm pretty sure the rest of the coaches in our conference are the same way, um, but I do think that we're probably here at Prairie View in a better situation than. Uh, Dante Jackson down at Grambling, where it's a religion. I mean, it's a wonder they have any sports at Grambling mm-hmm. football. I think you'd have to agree with that, Mike, because of the legendary right. Eddie Robinson and what he's been able, what he was able to build. So, yeah, we 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 we're just a second. We know that. We know where we are uh, in the pecking order. Um, but I still think it. it uh, I still think we all can can work really hard to be the best that we can be. Uh, to to be acknowledged. Uh, to put out a strong program. Um, and, and to continue to fight for championships. That's probably, you know, the, the, the best I can probably uh, describe, you know, how I feel. Um, but we're going to continue to fight to get all that we can. I think that we can squeeze a little bit more blood from this, from this turnip to be able to help men's basketball. Um, but but I, I definitely feel that it will probably, Prairie View will always be considered a football school. You're right. <laughs> right. And, and now when you see that and your alma mater, U of H, yeah, they've had some mm-hmm. successful – uh, basketball runs, but they like to think of themselves as a yes. football school. They're headed to the Big 12. They're excited. I'm happy for you guys yeah. as well. Uh, and then <laughs> you look at Texas Southern. They they uh-huh. put in the money in football, but their their bread is buttered in basketball. If you're asking me, when you right. see those two programs in close proximity, and um, what's in the water that gives them that tournament run that, that we could siphon up the road down uh, up here at the hill uh, to, to, to get some of that antidote going. Because it seems like, and I'll just stick it in within the Southwestern Athletic Conference, Texas Southern has a magnet or something that just pulls them through tournaments. And, and yes. what, do you, what do you think that antidote is? I think right now, Probably they have Johnny Jones and no one else does. No, I'm joking. No. Um, <laughs> he's a he is a quality coach. I think um, stability. Okay, you know you touched on you know administration and things like that. I just think stability. I think that those programs have consistent stability um, and leadership, and it's it's no one's fault here, but we just have not had that for whatever reason, right? Um, intentional, unintentional circumstances uh, that have caused us to uh, 
have multiple athletic directors over the past six years. I think that's well documented, it's understood, and it's not a criticism, it's just a concern. And I, and they haven't. I mean, obviously they had Dr. McClellan over there for numerous years and they had tremendous stability, continuity. And then they had his understudy, Kevin Granger, who assumed the reins and seems to be doing uh, a really, really solid job over there, continuing what Dr. McClellan and those guys uh, started. University of Houston, they have, you know, they have a strong board, right? And they have people that, uh, even when there's change, you know, in athletic directors or coaches, you know, they're able to, uh, at least in the last, you know, six or seven years, they're able to steady the ship. And obviously the strong leadership that they have with Kelvin Sampson in basketball, um, who I think the best coach in the country. Uh, football, is, you know, is to be determined. I mean, obviously they had some success. But I just don't think that they're still an upper echelon football program. And we're getting ready to find out here real shortly as they, as they go into the Big 12. But I just think that if you have that leadership, steady leadership um, at the top, you know, um, you know, as far as your athletic administration is concerned, I think that bodes well for you. It gives you a better chance to establish a culture, not just a culture inside the gym for men's basketball, but just a culture here uh, in your department. Uh, and everybody, you know, knows the direction, knows where we're going, what we're doing, what, what the goals are what the expectations are. And I think that it gives you a better chance to uh, have success, sustain su- su- success, uh, and build a uh, and, and, and build a, a brand. And, and I think we've gotten off to a pretty good start uh, in men's basketball. Obviously, we haven't, we, we, we're not where we want to be right now, but obviously that's the goal to get back uh, to the top. And I think that whenever we get this situation resolved as to, you know, who's going to be the person that's going to be in the seat. I think that's going to be really, really good. We'll sleep better at night as coaches, knowing that uh, we, we have a leader that's in the seat and is going to be there and going to support us and give us the things that we need to be successful. Absolutely. I can imagine that does make recruiting a bit easier. It makes coaching mm-hmm. a bit easier. Now, mm-hmm. when you're having, uh, let's say, unstable leaders to report to when it comes time for you to build your schedule, and we know in times past, uh, there's been a heavy load, not just on your basketball program, but basketball programs throughout the conference. And uh, mm-hmm. I've been on record for saying, and I'll say it again, that to me it was a lazy way of fundraising for athletic directors is to schedule basketball programs to go play 13 uh, uh, money games. And, yeah, you might strike uh, midnight every now and then and, and mm-hmm. steal one. But you're setting yourselves up uh, for failure for the sake of getting an extra buck or two. And then when you do show up for conference play, and you can go uh, 17-1 in conference, but your overall record is 17-16 and 16 because of the brutal uh, first, uh, first half mm-hmm. of the season. Uh, right. Speaking with Coach Petaway, uh, who I consider the basketball guru for our network, okay. he is – liking the formula of maybe five guaranteed games and moving on to playing more reasonable home and home games, games that are doable, games that are winnable, uh, right. to help build the RPI. Do you see that as a potential formula in the future? You know, I think that's probably the goal. I think uh, Mr. Dr. McClellan, you know, the, you know, our commissioner, our leader, uh, to try to uh, adopt that model. Don't know if it's something that's going to be attainable to be able to do it. Um, I think here personally, I think we've got a pretty favorable situation that, you know, what we're asked to bring in is uh, is uh, doable. I, I don't think it stretches us too thin. I don't think it puts us in a position where we can't be successful in some of those uh, uh, pre-conference games. Um, so I, I actually like where we are right now. So um, they're not asking us to do anything that's ridiculous. I think they've been very fair. I think the administration here uh, has done a good job, I feel, in, in that regard and been very uh, open and transparent, uh, you know, with us, men's basketball, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and taking the load off a little bit to where we're not up in that 700, 800,000 uh, game guarantee. It's very doable. Uh, and I'm, I'm comfortable with it. I thought we had a pretty good schedule this year in our conference. That was uh, some games on it that we actually won a few and probably dropped a few that we should not have. But I thought we at least had a chance, you know. And obviously A&M was very tough. And, but everyone except A&M, you know, I felt were games that, uh, that Oklahoma State threw them in there as well. But I think other program, Northwestern, I thought we had a pretty good chance. And, uh, you know, the other schools that, that we uh, faced, I thought we – UIC, Illinois, Chicago, I thought we had a good chance. 
Um, and we were more than competitive. We went down to the wire for a while with Northwestern. But again, just speaking to me individually about our program, I think I think that we're at a good number. But if we were able to reduce it, yeah, and, and play, you know, six games or seven games, whatever the case may be, and do some home and homes, things like that, I think that bodes well for everybody in the conference, and it would help our net. And it would put us in a position maybe that we could have not just a, a conference champion as the only one that's representing the conference conference tournament champion to get in the NCAA. Maybe we could get in that large. And I think that's the goal. Will it happen? Remains to be seen. But I know Dr. McClellan is in the room fighting for the Southwest Athletic Conference. You have to commend him. I think he's done a really good job. I think he's helped elevate the profile of our league. And that's all that you can ask. You know, Rome wasn't built in a day. That's a marathon, not a sprint. But I do like the direction in which we're going. But if that's something that we can attain, Mike, and, and make that the model, let's guarantee games five or six and, and be able to do some home and home, I think that would be great. And I'll be all in favor of doing that. Okay, now you know that when they start talking about expansion, it's just a matter of time before expansion happens, and I'm talking about the NCAA, right? Um, right. Are you in favor of the 96 team bracket for the NCAA tournament? I think so, yeah. I'm in favor of more. I don't know if that number is something that you know would be the number, but I definitely think we can extend it, especially if it gives uh, everyone a chance to have uh, you know, uh, multiple teams going to the tournament. You know, and I don't know how that looks in terms of the number, but if you have a good enough, you know, record, good enough season, you know, and you can win 20 plus games and not win your conference tournament. I mean, why would you not be considered to be, you know, a team that should be in the postseason, not the NIT, but the NCAA tournament? So I'm definitely in favor of them expanding it, you know, because I just think right now with the 68, I mean, it's a, it's just a crazy time, exciting time. But if you can add to it and extend it a little bit, I mean, why would you not? Do you think that would have an impact on the NIT, or do you still let the NIT run the way it runs, or do you do away with it if you go to 96? I think that you still would have your 32, in a, in, I think it's the number 32 in an NIT team. Um, and I just think that would help that as well, you know, because you're, gonna, you're still going to get a good group because it's a lot of good basketball, Mike. Sometimes the records are indicative of how good teams are. And uh, it, look, you look at us this year, I, I thought we had a really solid team but, uh, you know, the thing about it, and I don't make excuses, I, I, I deal in truth. I think you know me. Uh, you know, we, and I was listening to people complaining so much about the injury that Texas Southern. Texas Southern didn't have as many injuries as we did, Mike, right? We had three mm-hmm. guys that broke the same hand in a, in a, in a six-week span, right? Yeah, who's a roster mm-hmm. broke his hand. He's, he's what, probably our, was our most consistent player at the time. Uh, Doc Nelson, our starting point guard, broke his hand, was out six weeks. Uh, Brian Miles is one of our best post players, young post players, broke his hand, he was out six weeks. Uh, Trajan Wesley was supposed to be our starting uh, point guard, ended up getting a concussion, his fifth concussion, ended up missing eight to nine weeks. We had a rash of injuries. So, I, you know, had that not happened, there's no telling where we would have been record-wise. We were 500 in conference, but I think we would have been even stronger had we not had the injury. So I think that we were a team that if you look at our record, you know, 13 and 19, I think, or whatever it is, I think that we were better than our record indicated. So you, you do have that a lot. So, yeah, I think, you know, expanding – Across the board, I'm all in favor of doing that. If it gives teams an opportunity to continue to play, good teams sometimes get omitted, but I definitely think it would be good for, for college basketball to have more of this of this great time of year of March for sure. No doubt about it. Now, here's something that um, I've been very vocal about, and my position from outside looking in: the winning of your regular season conference really doesn't mean anything. Mm-hmm. It, it doesn't quantify you. Yeah, you get the NIT if you don't win the tournament. But like right. you were saying, it's about being in that NCAA tournament. Um, and I don't want to ask this question because I know everybody plays to win. But right. really, would it be favorable? Just I mean, let me qualify for the tournament. Let me get my team and my rotations together, and we just make a run in the tournament, and we'll go to the tournament in the NCAA side representing the conference because there is no reward other than acknowledgement for that weekend that you won the regular season title. Right. Well, I think, you know, Mike, it's a personal choice, right? It's a personal feeling. Um, You know, I think anytime you can be the best at at something – I think you shoot for that, right? I mean, you look at some of these coaches that run around here, oh, it's 800 wins, 900 wins. Well, probably was, how many of those were championships, right? Probably a lot of those regular season games, and they keep mm-hmm. going, they keep record. You get in the Hall of Fame for winning games, right? So I think you're right, you know, at this stage where it is, it is, you know, the, the, the Johnny Jones model, if you will, to go through, be solid, have some, have some momentum, 
But when you get into that last week of the of the conference season, really to kind of start playing your best basketball and win those three games in Birmingham, um, you know, we want to try to do it all, right? Because we we've done it all. You know, obviously it's been a little bit of a little bit of a little, little bit of a stretch since we did it last. We want to get back there again, but being able to be dominant in the, in the conference, win the regular season, and going on winning the conference tournament, uh, you know, I mean, I think that's where it's at. Um, but 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 you're right. I mean that 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 those three days in, in March, if you can't win it, that becomes a focus. You know those those three straight days that you have to play. Um, so you know again, in a perfect world, you'd want to do it all. But obviously, like you say, you, you're you're most going to be remembered uh, for being in that being in one of the 68 uh, in March. But I don't think that it takes away from your the desire to win every game that you play to win as many championships as you possibly can. Because again not trying to be selfish. Everybody talks about legacy. It's more on the other side than it is on this side with us. But, the, but uh-huh. legacy is something that's always talked about. So I think that is important. How am I remembered as a coach at Prairie View and m Right? The guy won championships uh, and, you know, got went to multiple NCAA tournaments because I'm still here and that's still a goal of mine. But the guy won championships, regular season, conference tournament championships. He was a winner. That's, that, that's how I want Byron Smith to be remembered from a personal standpoint that he was a winner. So in order to do that, Absolutely. you want to try to win every chance that you can. Yep. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And like I said, it was not the denouncing the regular season, yep. but it's no no reward yep. for it. But it's mm-hmm. just one of those crazy things. Now, I'm going to ask you a question without going into detail. It's just going to be a yes or no. Do you believe you have enough in your budget to have a successful program. Yes. Okay. Very good. I because I didn't when I'm looking at these uh, schools that made the runs, you know. And ironic enough, uh, people are gonna laugh at me and think I'm crazy when I say what I'm about to say. Mm-hmm. You know what team I paralleled uh, Prairie View more to than any this season in the tournament? Uh-oh. Princeton. Okay. And 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 here's why. You know, I don't have to tell you, you've been in the belly of a beast. Uh, mm-hmm. It's been a rigorous uh, uh, GPA requirement to play at Prairie uh-huh. View. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, no it's, you think? It's, it's about the same. Uh, just a little bit. Just a little bit, right? <laughs> and uh-huh. and you got about the same amount of student body. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and, and I don't know exactly what their budget is. <laughs> But some uh-huh. of the same circles. Like when you see Princeton, what did you see? Did you see a little bit of you all? Yeah. Um, yeah, probably. Minus the, the light-skinned guy they got out there on the court. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I knew you get a kick out of that, Mike Fritz. Uh, I, do, I, do feel, I do feel a lot of similarities. Yeah, I do. And... Um, you know, I think it is really like sometimes you 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 adopt the theory of being able to do more with less, right? And uh-huh. I think I've been that way since I've, I've been here. And I did say less that you know it's not as much to go around, obviously, with where we are. You know, but talking about it doesn't help it. You know, uh-huh. you, you, you're looking for you're looking for solutions. You know, be a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. Talking about what you don't have doesn't help anything. I think the glass is half full. I think if you or a person that, you know, overachieves sometimes. And I think that's, it's I always say this, it's like, you know, people talk about, you know, how they evaluate players. I think the really good players can win games for you. If, you, if you're really that guy, like if you're really that guy, then you being on the floor, you being out there, to guarantee four to five more wins a season. That, that, that's how I look at certain players mm-hmm. when you talk about their mm-hmm. value. I think the same thing can be said for coaches, right? You know, if you look at U of H, right, and they were very, very good as a team, it was some games that, you know what, you're like, man, you know, like I'm going to say that that Auburn game, that they were down by 10 at halftime, everybody had them dead in the water. I think anybody on that sideline but Kelvin Sampson, I think they probably moved that game. So, you know, it's the same thing, coaching. Sometimes you can just have a, a really, really good coach that can kind of win games that maybe, you know, it doesn't look like that you can and stuff like that. So, you know, again, not, not bragging or patting myself on the back. I just feel like, you know, I'm that coach that you got, you got a really good basketball coach, right? Everybody may mm-hmm. not think of that today, right? Because we hadn't, you know, you know, I was going to have critics and stuff like that. But I think I'm a pretty good right. basketball coach. And I think that we won games because Byron Smith's been on the sideline. I really do. And I'm going to continue to feel that way. That's the confidence I have to have. 
So when, uh-huh. when you think that way, when you think that way, you think less about what you don't have. And you just say, you know what, we got this, we got this, we got this, we got two players or three players. We got Dejuan Andrews, Andrews, we got Devontae Patterson, and you don't, right? We got Cam Mack, right. and you don't, right? We got Dennis Jones, you don't. We got Gary Blackson, and you don't. We got Byron, right. and y'all don't. <laughs> I like that. Look, let me ask you this, Coach. Um, has there been some games where you were obviously outcoached? You know what, to be honest with you, Mike, and it's funny if you bring that question about that in the conversation this morning. I don't think there's any such thing as being our coach. I think you have coaches who make good adjustments and ones who don't. Right? Now, if that falls under the uh-huh. offices or the title of being our coach, then yes. Okay, maybe I have been. But I do believe that you got ones who make the adjustments. At the end of the day, the game plan can be a certain way. The script can be a certain way. The execution has to be there. Right? But I do think when mm-hmm. it comes down to coaching, it's about adjustments. I don't see, I can't remember, right, that it's been a game where I would say, you know what, he just flat out out coached or made just better or better adjustments. Now, on the flip side, I can say that I feel that way. I feel that we went into a certain school in Mississippi about a month or so ago Uh-oh. and played a really good <laughs> basketball team, right? Uh-huh. It's a team that had kind of beat their chest a little bit. A coach okay. maybe that kind of beat his chest a little bit when he was in this building, yelled and screamed Uh-oh. at the fans. And I think that when it came down to making adjustments, because it was the same basketball team that, that beat us in this building three weeks before, I think that this staff here at Prairie View made better in-game adjustments that second time around. And Prairie View was able to get on that bus with a victory, beating a top team in Mississippi. So okay. somebody asked me what I you know what happened. And I, I, I said this, Mike, and you can tell me what you think about it. I said, an old cat don't teach a young kid everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I'm loving this. I'm loving it. We're talking with Byron Smith, head basketball coach of the Prairie View A and M University Panthers here at the Open Mic Broadcast Network and the Mike Prince Show. Look, Coach, uh, you know we have to adjust our philosophies as these games evolve, as the players evolve, uh, the mental aspect of everything that we have to deal with on and off the court. Um, When you are recruiting a player, and in your case it's basketball, um, I think, this is just me, because of the low percentage of anyone going to the next level, we know no matter what level you on, it's only 2% of guys that get paid to play this game for the rest of their lives. Do you look for that player that is what you, as you refer to, that dude, or that player that can be coachable and a good teammate with other dudes? I, I, I definitely want to recruit. The, we want to recruit the players that are going to be coachable and be uh, the ultimate teammate. I, I think that um, because I think that if they have the respect, uh, respect their teammates, they have the respect of their teammates. I think anything is possible. I think that the teams that the best continuity, uh, obviously, are the ones that have the chance to go the furthest. And I think continuity is is, is what brings about that is respect. Right? They always say. I talk to our players all the time. I say, you know, I'm not here to be liked, and I'm not. I don't want. You, it's not about you guys liking each other. It's about you guys respecting each other. It's about you respecting the coaching staff, respecting us. And I think if you do that, if you have a respect, I think trust comes. And I think if you have respect and trust uh, in a program amongst the coaching staff, with us working together as men, and, and and with our players respecting us, trusting us, and respecting each other, and trusting each other. I think that you can go a long way. So I think you have to make sure you recruit those type of young men um, that feel that way and that those those things are important. So, so yeah, it would be the latter, um, you know, uh, the, the type of players that we want to recruit here. Right. Now, a lot of people don't know. I've had the luxuries of traveling with you guys in times past. Uh, you are very, very strict on what these guys put in their bodies that mm-hmm. are going to represent you and the Panthers on their floor. Mm-hmm. How difficult has it been for players to adjust to that strict diet and buy in to be a part of your program? It's been, it's been uh, very, very difficult at times. And, you know, probably our two most challenging years since I've been head coach here, Mike, uh, has been the last two. 
And the reason being is because of, um, you know, what we've been asked to do in terms of getting kids in school. And that's been well documented. You know, you're bringing in a, a bunch of older kids, you know, some 22, 23, 24, which really are, you know, you know they're, they're, they're grown men. And they've been mm-hmm. doing things a certain way for a number of years. And then it's like you're asking them to come in and to give up their comfort, basically. And it's hard to do as an individual, give up your comfort, right? We know I'm in mm-hmm. charge of our comfort, right? So that's been the right. tough part, you know, getting these guys to, uh, you know, you see guys walking around the airport and they got a Sunday in their hand. I'm like, man, they got M&Ms on them. Uh-huh. Like, man, you know, we can uh-huh. play tomorrow. We can let play tomorrow night, right? We, so again, you know, you put stuff in your body in season uh, for uh, performance. It's not about comfort. So it's a mind. Mm-hmm. So you come in and you, when you're recruiting them, you, you know, you make sure you put that out there. Like I'm, I'm, I'm a big nutrition guy. You know, you can't just eat everything and, and, and you know, be ready to go out and perform at the level that the, the way that we play, how hard we play, the energy and the effort that we give, it, it's a, it requires a sacrifice. You know, hydrate your body, get your rest. You know, you, the extracurricular stuff. You gotta, you gotta make a sacrifice. You know, and so to answer your question, it's been very difficult. Um, and then, you know, but what we do, Mike, is, you know, the, the pregame stuff is obviously the most important. The postgame, we kind of ease off a little bit, right? You know, you have a big win. Hey, man, the kids, they want to go to Waffle House. They just want to eat some junk. They want to eat McDonald's. And we have a win, uh, you know, after right after the game. Maybe we'll let them do that because we got, you know, 48 hours to get ready for the next one when you're on the road and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. here at home, it's a little harder because you're not with them. Uh, you know, those, you know, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, Monday night, right? It, you know, it's it's different uh, when you're at home and their families are around and they go out to eat with their mom and dad after the game and grandma and stuff like that. So it uh, it, 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 it it it's it's challenging. But I will tell you this: most of the things, Mike, that we've asked these guys to consider that because again, if you're selling to these guys, that just if you trust me, remember I will I go back to that trust, right? Which is important. You know, mm-hmm. kids of today, Mike, you know, they listen to what, who they like, which I think is a mistake, right? It ain't, it ain't who's right and who's wrong, it's what's right and what's wrong. But if you mm-hmm. can earn their trust, then they, then they will believe. I'm not one of these coaches, oh, man, my players are run through a brick wall. you crazy as hell, you're going to run through a brick wall. You're going you're gonna to get hurt. <laughs> I want you to run through a brick wall, right? But I do want right. you to trust me. That That's the equivalent of a brick wall for Byron Smith. Trust me. Just trust me. you got to trust somebody besides your mom. That's what's wrong with a lot of these kids, Mike. Mama, mama. Watch how you say that. When I recruit Mike, I listen to how I watch this guy, how he talks with mom. If he say mama, you know, he's still attached to the baby. Well, well, mama, I call mama. it a T-baby. Yeah. A T-baby. There you go. Boom. I can't say it, but this is Mike's print show, so you can say it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I agree. On yes, sir. We'll bridge so, the yeah. gap for you on that one. We'll bridge the gap Absolutely. for you on that Six Absolutely. foot nine, uh, a yep. well built machine, <laughs> but still a T yep. baby. I understand, there sir. I do there understand. Hundred percent, the kids say. Hundred percent. Oh yeah, one hundred. We're gonna keep it one hundred too, sir. Yeah. Now look, right. when you when you when you talk about the the challenges, and that's part of the the coaching in the twenty first century, the new millennial kids or whatever the hell they mm-hmm. are now. Uh, Z factor, Z gen, whatever they are. I don't mm. know. They're youngsters. Okay. When yeah. when you mm. see how you you got these teams making these runs, and uh, you have a certain uh, uh, standard that you want mm-hmm. as Byron Smith, the university mm-hmm. has a certain standard, and and we touched on this a little bit before, uh, mm-hmm. with the lack of direction from the leadership position. Is it challenging to figure out how you want to build your team without no sense of direction of what's expected, other than the obvious? Well, you know, my, I, I think that I think that um, you know, right now, I think people that um, are either in the position or want the position. I think that they do have a, they have a vision. I think they have a plan. I think that it just hasn't been decided as to who's going to get an opportunity to exercise it. Right? Does that make sense? So, so, mm-hmm. so I guess with with all due respect, um, I think the person that's in the position right now, I think he's got a plan. I think he's got vision, and I think he would do 
a good job. It's just a matter of is he going to be in the seat, right? Is, does he want to mm-hmm. be in the seat? Or is it up to him to be in the seat? I, I don't know because I'm not privy to those conversations. But, you know, again, if we're talking about where we are right now, um, it, it, it is a bit challenging because you're right now, you're going a certain direction. You know, you're going east right now. You know, four months, five months from now, when that, when that, whoever's in that position, if it's not the same person in it now, then you might, you might have to be told, that, well, you know, you need to kind of go west. So you have to go in a different direction. So it is mm-hmm. challenging. But I think if you stay true to who you are, you, you focus on, and I know this is cliche, you know, you focus on the things that you control. And the thing is that regardless as to who is in that seat, I'm pretty sure the expectation is going to be for the basketball team to win and for Byron Smith to win games. So that's what we're right. going to prepare to do. Now, you know, are we going to be, um, you know, eating at Ruth Chris or are we going to be eating at Mama White? That that that, that, <laughs> that, remains, that remains to be seen. That, that that that's a sixty-four thousand dollars question. And who and, and who's going to be paying? Who's going to pick up the bill? Those right, 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 right. Well, look, which if we're going to Ruth Chris, if we go on the roof, Chris, you picking up the deal. <laughs> Mama White, I have to work out some, give us some free advertising or something. We work it out. <laughs> so I got you. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, look, man, I I know um, you're always on the grind. Can you give us a sneak peek of who some of the nine conference basketball points will be for the next season? Yeah, right now we've got obviously we've got to go back out to. Uh, a, a very angry Washington State Cougar team. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> we, we uh-huh. And they're gonna be angry again. They're gonna yeah, be angry, angry again. Yeah. Yeah. On that trip, we're gonna pick up uh, Seattle University. We're gonna go out to Ames, Iowa, and freeze our butt off uh, in December. And we got uh, we're gonna pick up uh, Northern Iowa uh, out on that trip. And then we've got uh, we got our, our big brother down the road on December thirtieth, uh, Texas A and M. Um, and uh, Rice uh, is going to be on our schedule again to be determined on the date. And we've got about another five or six that we got to add in there. We'll have a couple of NAIAs, obviously, uh, but we got a few more to add. So we're, we're working on scheduling as we speak. But I'm pretty sure that probably by, you know, in the next month, uh, first of May, we'll probably be done, um, you know, with our schedule. But uh, it'll be competitive, but I think it'll be realistic, and I think it'll be one that could definitely benefit us. Uh, as we head into uh, the, the, the chase uh, for another SWAC championship and uh, tournament championship in, in the postseason bid this upcoming 23-24 season, Mike. Okay, well, look, my final questions for today, at least. i <laughs> put you on the spot, man. <laughs> who's winning this championship this year? Who's going to win in the final four? And who's going to face off and who's going to be the winner? You know, to be honest, the, the direct deal, I think the winner of the uh, UConn-Miami game um, will be the uh, NCAA uh, champion. And uh, that's just kind of how I see it. Uh, I think those two teams have – no no disrespect to Florida Atlantic and San Diego State because obviously they play some good basketball. And obviously Florida Atlantic is the Cinderella, which everybody's got their eye on. Everybody's probably rooting for that's not at those other institutions that have a de- direct involvement with those other institutions. I think that's just the, the, the St. Peter's of this year. But I just think that UConn has probably been the most dominant team in the tournament. Yeah, I think you'd have to agree with that. They've been very mm-hmm. good. I mean, they beat they beat uh, Gonzaga like they stole something. And I know America, right. that's obviously America's team, and they, they America's not happy uh, with that. But I just think that they're just a mixture of toughness, uh, hard playing, they're connected. Uh, you know, and they're just playing some really, really strong basketball right now. But Miami is no slouch, and obviously beating Houston and beating Texas, I mean, that speaks very, that speaks volumes about the type of yes, you know, team that Miami has, and obviously got the experience there with Coach Larry Nega. But I definitely think that uh, I, my prediction is that UConn will beat Miami, and I think UConn will will cut down the nets on next Monday night. Well, I tell you what, my man. We'll come back and talk about it all over again. <laughs> Look, man, I appreciate you so much for taking our time for us. I mm-hmm. want to give you some closing thoughts and comments, sir, and the floor is now yours. 
Mike, great, great, always great to talk to you. I enjoy it. It's, it's one of my, you know, um, how would I say it, things that excite me the most, dealing with the media stuff. And you've been 100 since I've been the head coach here, and your support, unwavering support, is definitely not going to go unnoticed. And just want to, you know, to all of our uh, supporters out there, fans, alumni, uh, we appreciate your support, and we're going to continue to fight and work to try to be in a situation next year where we can make you guys all proud and, and have something to do in March. Uh, next year other than sitting in front of your TV have you sitting in an arena uh, watching the Panthers play as, as, as our players for the 23-24 season but appreciate all of you guys it's uh, it's definitely uh, that, that definitely uh, uh, how would I say it uh, uh, an exciting exciting thing uh, to be a part of and um, just the support is just uh, means so much to our program all right, he is Coach Byron Smith of the Prairie View a and University Panthers. I am the radio guy, Dr. Mike Prince. Don't forget, you can follow me on Twitter. Subscribe to the YouTube channel at the Open Mic Broadcast Network. And until the next time, you guys be blessed, and we'll see you on the other side.